Hello, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. The Office of Research and Innovation's mission is to foster the advancement of cutting edge research discoveries and technology at the University of Texas at Dallas. With our departmental resources, we provide faculty, staff, and students with a variety of specialized information and training to help efficiently navigate funding opportunities. During today's Hanover Research Supplemental Funding Webinar, Sarah Ott will present how to write a supplement project proposal and how it should complement the parent award. She will go over what grants support supplements, how supplements work, supplement requirements, and whether or not supplement awardees can be from another institution at this webinar. Sarah Ott is a managing grants consultant for Hanover Researcher, Research rather. She provides grant review writing and project design services for clients around the country, including major post-secondary institutions and academic research institutions. She predominantly works on health-related proposals, supporting a variety of investigators, including physicians, nurse researchers, pharmacists, medical faculty, and basic scientists. Her areas of expertise include clinical and translational science, patient-centered outcomes research, and program development and evaluation. I am Tiffany Willoughby, Research Education Programs and Outreach Assistant Director in the Office of Research and Innovation at UT Dallas. I will serve as your session moderator. Sarah, the virtual platform is yours. Thanks, Tiffany. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm going to skip through some slides because Tiffany introduced me um, and you can look at my background if you feel like you need to revisit when you um, receive a copy of these slides later on. But as far as today's topics go, I know Tiffany gave a great description of, of what we're going over today, but as far as learning objectives go, I, I want um, you all to understand what supplements are available to you um, through funders and review the considerations of the eligibility for those supplements and sort of know the differences and what the expectations are for them. And then to also learn how to apply for them, um, like Tiffany stated. So for S supplements, um, Health and Human Services, which is the umbrella organization for National Institutes of Health, we have two types of supplements. We have administrative supplements and competitive supplements or revision applications. And so there can be some, um, some confusion over what the differences are in these types of supplements. So an administrative supplement is a supplement that supports re research that's within the original scope of the grant that you're going to be supplementing. And then a competitive supplement or a revision application is a supplement that's going to request a change in scope. Those, that's really the main difference if you're thinking about um, what is going to, what sets these two types of supplements apart. Um, that's the key. So when we talk about supplemental applications, that's a request for an increase in support for your current budget period. Um, so you're expanding the scope of the approved project or program to meet some unforeseen increase in costs, and you can specify those budgetary changes required for the remainder of the project period as well as for the current budget period. Supplemental applications that request a programmatic expansion or a change in scope have to undergo objective review and are generally required to compete for support. So that's why it's called a competitive supplement or a revision application. Um, requests for administrative supplements, they can be awarded without objective review or competition. They're actually reviewed just by the internal staff and we'll talk more about that later. When you're looking at competitive supplements or revisions, that's an increase, a request for an increase in support in your current budget. Um, and the, the request specifies the budgetary change required for the, the period 
similar to the administrative supplement, but they're submitted using forms, instructions, and guidelines that are detailed in the original FOA and um, the parent grants FOA uh, is either expired or you're encouraged to apply via the guidelines um, based on some um, announcement from, from the program. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail. Search for admin supplements. Um, first, you can look at, if you're interested in um, HHS funding and the supplements under Health and Human Services, you can go to um, this site for NIH, the Central Resource for Grants and Funding Information, and you can first select the organization that you would like to look at supplements from. Um, so here you have the HHS is the umbrella organization, and then you have the sub organizations, which are AHRQ, um, CDC, the FDA. So you can click which ones you're interested in, or you can just select all. And then under the activity codes, you might be used to selecting activity codes like R01 or for research grants, um, an R21, or you're looking for K awards, but you can actually select admin supplement as an activity code using the site and it will bring up all of the administrative supplements. So those are the ones that are not competitive revision applications like we just discussed. So when you're applying to an administrative supplement for an existing grant, this is what the um, top of the program announcement would look like. Now, these additional funds are awarded as supplements to the parent award or activity code. So um, you need to be the PI of one of the parent awards. And I have a nice table that, that shows you all of the parent awards that um, would qualify for an administrative supplement in a slide coming up. But you would need to be the PI, the principal investigator, or know the principal investigator of one of the qualifying awards, um, and you would look for the program announcement that fits for that award. Um, so this one is an administrative supplement to existing grants program announcement. You can see the participating organizations. So if that principal investigator, or if you had a qualifying award, like uh, an NIH R01, um, under one of the participating organizations, so National Cancer Institute, um, National Institute on Aging, and you wanted to apply for, for an administrative supplement, you could submit under this program announcement. Um, the budget is limited to no more than the amount of the original award, and the project period has to be within the original period of the award. So if you were awarded for a five-year grant and your funding ended in March 2023, your administrative supplement would have to be would have to take place before March 2023. Um, you the, the supplement funds can be used for new research objectives. So this is something that um, principal investigators often are confused about. Um, you can propose new research objectives that does not change the scope of your research um, as long as they are um, related to your original project. So um, they tie into your original project objective, your original hypotheses. They make sense with your original specific aims. Um, you can propose new research objectives. So that's not a problem. That's not considered a change in scope when we're discussing administrative supplements. The due dates for administrative supplements are going to vary depending on the institute or center to which you're applying. So you need to look at the Institute or Center website um, or the applicable 
applicable notice of special interest if you're applying to a notice of special interest for appropriate application due dates. Um, you can also contact the program officer for the award. So if you are the principal investigator or you know the principal investigator of the award, you should know who your program manager is and you can contact them and ask them um, when the due date is and, and um, what program announcement they'd like you to submit through. You are always encouraged, um, regardless of what institute or center it is that you're applying through, you're always encouraged to apply early. Um, so that way you have adequate time to make any corrections or errors in the application during the submission process. Um, and the when we talk about the funding mechanism itself, um, it is being used to cover the administrative costs or cover the costs that are increasing based on the new objectives that you're proposing or the new work that you're proposing. Um, so as long as the research objectives are, like we said, within the original scope of the peer reviewed and approved project of yours, and if you have cost increases, they are for unanticipated expenses that fall within the original scope of the project, um, then you can include those in your budget. If you are applying for a supplement to a parent award, so the parent award is the original award, the R01 or, or whatever award you're supplementing, um, if that includes a multiple PI plan, then the supplement can be requested by any or all of the PIs and submitted by the awardee institution of the parent award. So let's say you have a multi-PI plan and your PIs are from different organizations. Um, regardless of who the PI is who's submitting your supplement, you are going to submit the supplement through the awardee institution. Um, so if the original R01 was awarded through UTD, then um, you would submit the supplement through UTD. Because when you submit to this particular program announcement, you are only receiving administrative review. So you're only receiving review by the staff and not by the institute, not by the institute or center and not by your peers. Um, then several NIH policies on resubmissions and applications don't apply. And we'll talk about how you do submit that application because of this and, and how it works. So there is no peer review. That's the first important piece of this for administrative supplements, no peer review. Instead, the administrative criteria um, are considered for the evaluation process. So the NIH staff at the Institute or Center where you are applying are going to assess first um, the reasonableness of your budget and period of support. So they're going to see if your budget and your requested period of support are justified and reasonable. And they are also going to look at the overall impact of your research. They're going to look at the ability of your proposed activities in the supplement to increase or improve the impact of your parent award. Um, and they'll also look at how the, that falls into the original scope of the award. So some of the impact questions they'll ask is if your supplement is going to increase the likelihood for the, pro for the project to influence the research fields that are involved, um, they'll be looking for an increase in the likelihood that the work on the supplement is going to enhance the candidate or the person who's doing the work, enhance their productivity and their ability to conduct independent research, especially if this is a student. And will the administrative supplement increase the likelihood um, for the individual doing the work to maintain a strong research program? For human subjects, there are 
protection of human subjects considerations, just like for typical NIH applications. And um, you, the, the staff, the NIH staff are going to look at your justification for the involvement of human subjects and your proposed protections. Um, and they're going to assess for the same five review criteria that you would be used to seeing on an NIH application. And so that's risk to subjects, the adequacy of the protection, the potential benefits, the importance of the knowledge to be gained, and the data and safety monitoring if you're looking at clinical trials. If your research meets um, the 45 CFR Part 46 um, criteria for NIH, um, and that's research that's exempt, then they're going to evaluate for the justification of your exemption and the human subject involvement and um, the materials to support that. You'll also have inclusion of women and minorities and individuals across the lifespan, just like you would um, for your typical application. And you're going to have um, vertebrate animal considerations if you're working with animal models. Biohazard considerations. Um, for the biohazards, they will assess whether the materials or procedures are potentially hazardous. Um, so you'll need to cover that if you have any biohazards involved. So this is just the administrative supplement um, evaluation by the NIH staff. It's not a full peer review. And um, when you submit to the funding opportunity, your project is assigned to the awarding component, which is the institute or center um, that your parent award comes through. And um, these are the criteria that it will be evaluated on. You might be interested in very specific um, supplements, and there are research supplements to promote diversity and research, research supplements to promote re-entry into the biomedical and behavioral uh, research fields. These supplements need to be requested by the PIs of the active branch, just like the other administrative supplements. And they are expected, the PIs of the original award are expected to serve as your mentor um, or, or the mentor for the candidates nominated for the support. Um, these applications are accepted in all research areas that are supported by eligible NIH grants. And the candidates who are eligible for support under diversity supplements include individuals at the high school, undergraduate, graduate, postgraduate, and investigator career stages. Um, and they must come from groups that have been shown to be underrepresented in science. That definition is probably broader than you think. Um, so I encourage you to look at the notice for underrepresented in science and that definition that the NIH has. Um, so you can take a look at who would qualify for a diversity supplement. That's probably a more broad definition that, than what you might be thinking. There are four um, different subgroups. And these can be individuals from underrepresented racial and ethnic groups, individuals with disabilities, individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds. So let's say, um, you have a student who is a first generation college student that's considered being someone from a disadvantaged background. Um, and then there are also candidates who are seeking to re enter research um, from being in the, uh, you know, from being in a, a um, environment that in a non academic environment. And that would be for the re entry supplement. So the re-entry supplement, you have to have a um, doctoral degree and have been in a postdoctoral faculty position um, at the time that you left active research. And for the diversity opportunity, that's available to, PD, to PIs um, of research grants um, who have, may have also um, acquired a disability and then need additional support to accommodate their disability in order to continue to work on their project. So those are two ways if you've, um, you know, either left the field and come back, you might look at the re-entry supplement. Also, if 
you are in a certain position and you've acquired some sort of disability that has affected your um, work, then you could you could also look at the research supplement to promote diversity. Um, the activities proposed in the diversity or reentry supplement have to either advance the objectives of the parent grant and support the research training and career development of the candidates. So um, not only do you need to have a research project that fits under the original scope of the award, but you also have to have a career development plan um, for the person who is leading the work of the supplement. The award decisions for these types of supplements are based on the merit of the research training potential of the application. So they look at um, the research training, the direct research training of the diverse uh, PI recipient or the um, reentry recipient. They also look at the relevance to the career objectives and the relationship of these elements to the research priorities of the institute or center under which the, the parent award falls. So when you submit the diversity supplement or the reentry supplement, um, the proposed activities have to be within the project period, just like the other supplements um, within the project period of the parent award. And the duration of the supplement should be sufficient in length to provide a meaningful career development experience. So that's an extra layer of consideration with this type of supplement. Make sure that you have enough time, not only for the research project, but also to cover the career development needs of the candidate um, and justify that time period well in your application. If you're looking to submit a supplement, a diversity supplement for high school or undergraduate students, the period of the support has to be um, as short as a summer um, or can be as short as a summer experience or one academic year. So um, don't feel like you need to have multi-year support for someone who is a high school student or an undergraduate student, it would be acceptable to have a summer experience um, or one academic year um, spent on the diversity supplement for someone who is at that level. A two-year supplement period is typically appropriate for graduate students and postdoctoral researchers and even more senior investigators. So if you're looking at um, a diversity supplement, supplement or even a re-entry supplement, a two-year supplement period is typical. Um, if you're in the graduate, postdoctoral, or um, more senior investigator space, less than two years for that level of a um, recipient is typically um, not going to be a good idea to include. So. Um, the one-year experiences, the summer experiences, you want to leave that to the undergraduate and high school student supplements. Um, anybody above that, you want to have at least a two-year experience. If you do want to propose less than two years for somebody at that level, you really would need to have a detailed explanation and um, consult with your NIH program manager um, prior to that submission. Just like administrative supplements, you can't use diversity and reentry supplements to expand the scope of the parent grant. So these applications are also reviewed by program staff and they'll look at the scope of the planned activities in your supplement and evaluate their merit and training potential. So you need, um, as an applicant, applicant, you need to contact the program manager assigned to your parent grant, grant during preparation of the application uh, and discuss your goals and objectives and make sure that they agree that it's within the scope of your award. You could also discuss um, some other issues with the program officer like candidate eligibility. If you have a question about the, the candidate's eligibility for the award, um, 
the research development and mentoring plan activities, those can differ. The expectations can differ from institute um, to institute. So even if you have prior applications to look at or if you have a peer who has a similar supplement, if it's at a different institute, you might want to still check with the program officer to see how they feel about your career development plan um, for the award. And the potential of the candidate who's submitting the supplement to continue their research career as an independent researcher. Um, you also want to look at the match of the supplement objectives and the research priorities of the Institute and Center, and that's something the program officer can provide feedback on as well. So this is the research supplement to pro promote diversity and health related research. Um, the, the two main objectives of this particular program announcement are to enhance the diversity of the research workforce and support um, support the research of individuals from diverse backgrounds. And we talked about um, what those di diverse backgrounds are. So they might be a little different than what you would think. So these funds enhance the diversity of the workforce by recruiting and supporting these students and eligible investigators. Um, it's available to program investigators of research grants who also are or become um, disabled or have a disability. I like person first language. I know NIH doesn't use it, um, but but people who um, acquire a disability and um, it's available to accommodate um, them in um, new work experiences. As long as it's within the scope of the original project period. So the funds are available um, to recruit and support um, that spectrum of applicant from high school students to postdocs to eligible investigators who are faculty and um, it's really meant to enhance the participation of these individuals with diverse backgrounds and then to um, prepare them for success in an independent research career following the funding. So enhancing the diversity of the workforce by supporting um, the investigators through a supplement to a parent award. And these are the, uh, the activity codes that are eligible for diversity supplements. Quite a few. Um, so if you have one of these awards or if you um, or if you have a mentor or you know a PI who um, is on an activity code, a funded activity code like this, um, then it there is potential to submit a diversity supplement as a part of, of the parent award. For re-entry into biomedical and behavioral research, there are two uh, objectives to this announcement. First, to support for part-time research um, by individuals returning to the scientific workforce and then preparing scientists to apply for um, fellowship, career development, or our type of words and independent uh, research support. So um, the, the NIH Institutes and Centers support individuals with high potential to re-enter an active research career after an interruption of at least six months. So you have to have been out of um, out of the research field or um, sort of not active in publishing and working at, for at least six months. And this could be due to family responsibilities or other qualifying circumstances. Um, most candidates who apply for reentry supplements are going to have a doctoral degree or equivalent, um, but some awarding institutes and centers enable pre-doctoral students, including those enrolled in dual degree programs to apply. So it's something you need to look at on an institute and center basis. Um, the reintegration supplements enable those PIs to find scientific environments after leaving um, 
certain environments. So some are even directed to if someone has departed um, the workforce because of unsafe or an unsafe or discriminatory environment, um, or if there was an issue of harassment in a previous work um, space, then they provide uh, they will provide a reentry supplement to um, fund work at a new uh, you know, at a new place of employment and a new academic institution. Postdoctoral and predoctoral students are eligible to apply for reintegration, um, and that can also be done to transition to a safe and supportive research environment to um, complete their graduate degrees. The award criteria themselves um, require qualifications of the candidate. Um, so that, that includes certain career goals, um, uh, prior research training, the research potential of the candidate, and their research experience. Um, there is a plan for the proposed mentored research experience and its relationship to the parent grant. So even though this might be a more senior PI um, or a more senior candidate who's applying as the lead on the supplement, um, that individual would still have the PI on the parent award as a mentor, something to keep in mind. And then um, the staff will look at evidence that the experience is going to enhance the candidate's research potential, um, that that the activities of the, the re-entry um, award are going to foster the independent research career trajectory of the candidate, and that there is um, appropriateness of the mentoring and career development plans. So similar to the diversity supplement, um, they'll also look at the strength of the mentor's commitment to the applicant and the institutional commitment to the applicant. So there are a couple more layers um, that aren't as that aren't considered major uh, review criteria in the diversity supplement as much as they are in the reentry supplement. So reentry is, is really looking more at um, institutional commitment than the diversity supplement is. So for the supplement application process, it's critical um, that you follow the submission instructions and the funding opportunity announcements and the program announcements we just looked at. There are links to those in the slide set that you'll receive. All forms need to be completed for the supplemental activities only. Um, so you don't need to worry about uh, filling in the forms uh, for the original parent award. Uh, I've seen that and that's a typical client um, you know, something that we see with clients where they'll fill in the supplemental activities, um, but then they'll also complete uh, certain sections for the parent award just to have all of the forms filled out. So just closely read the program announcement. Make sure that you're only completing the forms you need to for the supplemental activities and you're not doing mo more work than you need to. Um, and then the complete diver the complete supplement request package needs to include so that would be a brief proposal and this I, I want to say that this can be different depending on the program announcement and um, the institute or center this is for re-entry supplements and diversity supplement supplements mainly but you do want to read the program announcement so re-entry supplements the request package includes and the diversity supplement request package includes your brief proposal so you're going to describe your project and training and your career experience in six pages this is where you are going to um, tell the staff basically the summary of the funded award um, so you're going to provide them with a description of the funded award and then how your proposed supplement relates. This is your opportunity to show the program staff how your supplement ties into the scope, the original scope of the parent award. Um, so you don't want to just 
uh, copy and paste the, the project summary from the parent award um, into this section. You want to have a discussion of, um, you know, these are the three objectives of the parent award. This is where we are at right now as far as working on these objectives. And the supplement I'm proposing fits in to these objectives or fits into this project in this way. Um, so be very clear about that. Your training and career development plan is for the candidate. And that can include coursework. So if it's somebody for whom that's appropriate, um, you could include coursework in certain um, research methods. Um, it could be coursework on uh, grant writing, whatever fits into that individual, the candidate's goals. You can also include conference attendance, um, workshops, and presentation opportunities. So those are just a few examples of some of the um, training and career development activities you might include in a supplement award. For the mentoring experience of the PI and description of how the mentors are, are going to interact with you, um, they're going to talk about their commitment um, to you as a candidate and how they can support you through your award. So a lot of that is going to be access. The staff want to make sure that you have access to the PI. I've worked on several supplements where the PI of the parent award is at a different institution. And the candidate who's applying for the supplement is, is maybe at UTD and the PI of the parent award is at um, UConn. So uh, we need to talk about access. So what is the what is the commitment as far as how are you going to, you know, regardless if you're at the same institution or at different institutions, how are you going to communicate? What type of access do you have to the PI and how are you going to work together? What's the level of, of involvement? And then what are those specific activities? So you also want to have as a part of this proposal, a plan and a timeline um, for the, the research and career development experiences. Um, so you want to have a, a, a Gantt chart of all of your activities, the research side, so your specific aims, your tasks related to those, and then the career development side, your trainings, your coursework, you want to have all of those in one timeline um, and show the, the timing and how it relates to um, the, the, the staff will want to see um, is, is the candidate receiving training in this methodology before they are using the methodology um, in, the, in the research project. So um, that's why you want to provide that all together in, in one timeline. For the second piece, for the candidate statement, this is typically three pages um, and includes your signature. And um, you're going to discuss why, um, why you're a good fit for the project and your background. Um, so how your background has led you to this point in your career. This is a first person document and it can be difficult um, for most PIs to think this way of, um, this is about you. This is not about the research so much. It is um, talking about yourself. Um, so use I, um, use, you know, I, I am going to do this. This is my background. You want to use first person. You want to talk about yourself. Um, and then the statement of eligibility, that's one page, um, but it's a signed statement from the PI of the Parent Award and your authorized signing official at your institution um, that says that you're eligible for the support under the program. Uh, so this is really important, and this is why I always encourage you to 
um, talk with your program officer for the parent award uh, because having their help to assess the eligibility of, of the potential candidate because sometimes there are um, sometimes there are characteristics of candidates that could make them ineligible for supplements and then you have this document that your institution is signing to commit to that um, eligibility and that the staff are reviewing so always double check the eligibility um, before you submit and before you um, go over this document with the, the people needed and the, the, to be involved. So the top um, criteria for this that are most important are citizenship. That's going to be a predominant concern. Um, if you're looking at something that is not, a, let's say, um, for a diversity supplement that is not a a sort of uh, racial or ethnic diversity, there is different information you're going to have to include. So um, if we're looking at disability, you need to include information on the nature of the disability, the circumstances of it, the background, um, the characteristics that you think confer eligibility under the program. So it can be really interesting to exercise and um, you know, presenting that information and sort of what candidates are comfortable with sharing. Um, so that's something to keep in mind if if you're looking at that avenue. For diversity supplements, um, you need to have a convincing description of how the candidate's going to address the issue of diversity within the national scientific workforce. Um, so you need to be able to present this is a diverse candidate, but also they are promising and, um, you know, have a goal to pursue independent research in this arena. Um, so you need to have a clear statement. And then a description of any current or previous public health service research grant support that the, the candidate has received with start and end dates. So there's some data gathering for this section as well. For component for the budget, um, this is a, a fairly basic budget compared to other um, application submissions for the most part, but review the program announcement um, and look at the application package components. Make sure you know what needs to, to be provided if you're looking at a, a modular budget. And You'll need to have a biographical sketch of the candidate, but then also of any investigators, any principal investigators who are going to contribute to the research or who are going to be mentoring the candidate. And then you'll also have to have the human subjects and animals documentation, just like you would need for a, a typical NIH application. If the candidate for the supplement is a student at another institution other than the grantee institution, so the consideration I brought up as an example, then the application has to include a signed letter from the official at the institution um, indicating that the, the participation of the level of effort is approved. And so it's got to be from the student's institution and saying that they approve the level of effort of the student and it's not going to interfere with their studies. If any of the research is going to be conducted off site, so that would be other than the grantee institution, then you have to have a letter from the institution that the research is going to be um, conducted somewhere else and it has to be signed by the candidate, the PI, and the ASO, the authorized signing official. If your supplement is based on disability, you also need to include a document that discusses reasonable accommodations that the institution is going to provide to the individual um, with a full description of how that support is going to be used by the individual. Um, and then the relationship between the accommodation and the project itself, how the accommodation relates to the activities in the project. 
These applications can be submitted at any time, and investigators are encouraged to submit applications in at least, I said, plenty of time ahead. Um, I, I'm saying four months <laughs> um, prior to the requested start date. Um, and really, some institutes and centers, if you're dealing with a parent award for a very busy institute or center like National Cancer Institute or NIGMS, I would look at six months or more um, before your anticipated start date right now. And Sarah? Uh huh. We have a question in the chat, and the question is, is the supplemental process the same at NSF? And if not, what are the biggest differences? So we did not prepare for NSF supplements today, and I am not a National Science Foundation expert. We have several folks on our team who are, um, but that is not my, my expertise. Um, but we can offline here, go back to individuals on our team and respond to that question. Thank you very much. Uh -huh. um, so if you're with a busy institute or center, I, I would look at that timing. And um, if you are on a shorter time frame, um, for something like a summer only research appointment for a high school student, um, I would submit that about, a, uh, about two and a half months before the expected start date. The applications are evaluated on a regular schedule, even though you can submit it at any time, um, but sometimes the funding decisions are influenced or delayed based on availability of funds and other factors. Competing revisions, um, only for this particular competing revision, this is an example for NIDDK and, and um, National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences. Um, but this program announcement um, is allowing applications to be submitted in response to an, a notice of special interest published by the, the institutes and centers involved. Only the applications submitted in response to the notice of special interest published by these institutes or centers are going to be allowed to apply for this particular uh, program announcement. And the difference between, if you remember back, between the administrative uh, supplements and the competing revisions is that there is a peer review. There's a, an advisory council review um, like a typical NIH review process, and um, the the application process is similar to a standard NIH application. The activity codes eligible for competing revisions are listed here. Um, there are several, so you need to uh, reach out to your program officer. Um, and make sure that you're selecting the correct program announcement if you have this type of parent award um, and you want to change the scope of your project. Um, that's what the competing revisions are for. Um, the administrative supplements are if you're staying within the scope but proposing new avenues. Okay, so um, with I'm going to talk a little bit about Hanover resources, and then um, we'll have some time for questions. But Hanover has grants webinars that are available to you outside of UTD um, that we provide monthly to all clients, and they're open to um, PIs at all our institutions and at non client institutions. So you can get notified of those upcoming grants webinars. Um, we also have grant alerts and projections that you can sign up for. So um, you could sign up, for instance, to receive um, grant alerts and projections and prospect, prospect funding on um, certain types of research that you are interested in, and that would come in an e email format. You can also receive emails twice a month um, for funding calendars. So it includes some, um, some of the most popular um, funding potential funding that, that's coming down the pipeline. And this is an example, grants calendar, um, just for you to see 
so if you would like to receive any of this, you can click the link to subscribe in our slide set. That is free and available to you through Hanover. Uh, we also have a grantsmanship training center, which is soon to be renamed. Uh, but right now it just includes uh, National Science Foundation career guidance. And that is free and available to you as a subscriber to Hanover and, and to all PIs who um, are listening to this. And so um, you can go here right now and uh, go through a self-paced training to um, create a, an NSF career proposal at this time. We are rebranding this, we're adding new content. It's going to also include um, popular National Institutes of Health mechanisms and other National Science Foundation mechanisms as well. And this is the link for it. And then we have um, the grant webinars and calendar that you can access on that same site. Um, so if you have any follow up questions um, just directed toward us after this session, feel free to email Aaron um, or um, your internal contacts and, and we will respond to those. But I'm going to stop presenting and open up for any questions. Excellent. Well, thank you. We will pause and take a beat to see if there are any additional questions in the queue. Um, and at this time, I do not see any. Um, but again, we can take a moment just to wait and see if any um, attendees do have questions that they want to pose. In the meantime, in the meantime, I do want to thank you, Sarah, uh, for sharing your time and wisdom with the attendees today. And audience members, if you enjoyed today's session, we hope that you refer a friend. So thank you again, Sarah and audience members. If you enjoyed today's session, please plan to suggest it to a friend. If you are interested in additional Office of Research and Innovation events, you can check out Office of Research and Innovation on Instagram and Twitter or subscribe to our newsletter. Feel free to use your phones to scan the QR code on the slide and I will post links in the chat as well. Um, if you have a moment, please take our research event survey and we look forward to having you join us for an upcoming Office of Research and Innovation event. Thank you and have a nice afternoon.